All right, here we go. So uh, without any further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Ty Lidman, who will take us careening down the slopes to learn about instantons and handle decompositions. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming here. Thanks for the invitation to speak in this seminar. Um, so one of the great things about Halloween is you get to masquerade. So today I'm going to try to masquerade as a gauge theorist and see how that goes. Um, so let me kind of start with a little bit of introduction um, to just kind of motivate some questions that we're going to study. So I'll ask something very vague to start. So given our favorite three manifold, uh, the question I want to ask is how simple of a four manifold can it bound? And you could pick, pick your sort of favorite complexity of a four manifold um, to try to study this question. And I'm going to measure this. I'm going to measure what simple means or measure what complexity is in terms of the minimal number of critical points of a Morse function. Uh, or equivalently, the minimal number of handles in a handle decomposition. So we know, say, why is a say say why is a closed, connected, orientable three manifold? We know it bounds some nice, smooth four manifold, and we want to ask how simple of a four manifold could that be? Um, and maybe what I'll do is maybe I'll just sort of define some notation for this. Maybe I'll say the sort of min crit of y is going to be the minimal number of exactly this. So let's say critical points of some Morse function. And I think it's, in some sense, a reasonable complexity to try to study, because oftentimes when we're working with four manifolds, we might really use a Morse function or use a handle decomposition to get a picture of our manifold and try to study that. So why not try to understand which manifolds sort of have the simplest pictures? Um, OK, so let's do an example. Uh, let's start with very low. Uh, very low numbers of min crit. So if this min crit is 1, that means my 3 manifold, my connected 3 manifold is the boundary of a 4 manifold. So there's at least a 0 handle. And I'm saying there's nothing else. And so that's telling me that y is, in fact, s3. And the way I'm realizing this sort of optimal uh, complexity is by thinking of it as the boundary of the 4 ball. Um, OK, great. It's always good if you know how to compute your invariant for, for something. Um, so next, we could try to ask about, well, what are the things whose min crit is 2? Well, we can just kind of write down what that means. Well, topologically, it means that y is going to be the boundary of something which has a 0 handle and one other handle. So it looks like B4. And then we could attach, well, we could attach a one handle. Or a two handle. Uh, we can't attach a three handle, because then that's going to disconnect the boundary. And if we attach a four handle, you know, we're not going to have any real three manifold on the boundary. If I attach a one handle, I'm going to have S2 times S1 on the boundary. If I attach a two handle, the boundary is going to look like surgery on some kind of knot. Um, well, S2 times S1 is also surgery on a knot. So, so really what I'm saying is that this is the same thing as Y is, is a surgery on a knot in S3. So I'll write it as N over 1 of K um, for some knot K um, and some integer n. Uh, now, we better not have k be 
the unknot and plus or minus one surgery, because then we'd get back to S3. But basically, if we get any other three manifold obtained by integral surgery on a knot, well, this is now kind of our optimal presentation uh, for a four manifold bounding R3 manifold. And you know, once you know your three manifold is surgery on a knot, that gives us some pretty strong topological constraints. Um, for example, this implies that the first homology of our three manifold is cyclic. So that's sort of an, um, an easy computation from the, the definition of Dane surgery, removing a neighborhood and re-gluing uh, the neighborhood of the knot back in. And so we see, you know, if I had something like RP3 connects some RP3 or the three torus, um, that's not surgery on a knot. And so any bounding four manifold has to have at least uh, sort of three handles in any handle decomposition. Um, and there's some, you know, sort of more general picture that we can have here um, about how the homology of our, of our manifolds is, is governing their complexity. Uh, so, for example, if I look at kind of the number of the generators of the homology in some, let's say, homology group of my four manifold, which bounds, um, well, that's giving me a lower bound for the number of uh, critical points or the number of handles. Right? I can use sort of my, my Morse theory to tell me that if I have a lot of homology, then I have to have a lot of critical points to build that four manifold. Um, that's not necessarily three manifold specific, but we can have an analogous three manifold constraint. Um, it's not too difficult to see that the number of generators of H1 of Y actually also gives a lower bound on this complexity for y. Okay, so the more homology my three manifold has, actually the more complicated any bounding four manifold has to be. Okay. So maybe I'll pose a question kind of looking at these general um, observations. So I, I want to ask if I have a, an integer homology sphere, so something with smallest possible homology, um, well, we could ask, first of all, must it bound a four manifold also with small homology? Uh, and, you know, also does it bound something with, um, you know, small number of handles? So does, it, does having small homology help keep your complexity very low? Um, and so um, for the first answer we would know is, is certainly not true. So for instance, if I look at the Poincaré homology sphere, then the Rockland, the, the Rockland invariant tells us that um, this can't bound an acyclic manifold. So it can't bound something with smallest possible homology. Okay. So the first part of this question just by itself is maybe not so interesting. Um, but when you do bound a, something with small homology, maybe you could hope that it's always built out of very few handles. Um, And that's also not true. So if I take the Poincaré sphere with some orientation, connect some with minus the Poincaré sphere, um, that does bound an, an acyclic manifold. Namely, I could puncture the Poincaré sphere and take the product with an interval. This is some nice integer homology four ball. Um, but actually, if we look at any bounding four manifold, 
Um, so any bounding four manifold with this nice property has a lot of handles. In fact, at least five. And so why is this true? Um, well, the, the key sort of uh, input of Tobbs is that if, if P connects some minus P bounds some homology ball, and let's say it was built out of very few handles. Let's say it was built out of uh, a one handle and a two handle. Um, well, then it would be contractible. So you can just compute pi 1, see that it's trivial. Um, but Taubes' theorem tells you that, well, if you have a, f a four manifold with boundary p connects on minus p and some constraints, uh, that manifold can't be simply connected. So let me write that more carefully. Um, so Taubes showed uh, if x is a definite manifold, so the intersection form is definite, uh, with boundary p connects some minus p, then pi 1 uh, has to be non-trivial, pi 1 of x. So, um, that's telling you that the kind of smallest way to build a homology ball can't happen. And if you just use an Euler characteristic argument, you'd see the next size for a homology ball would be five handles. Um, and in fact, using a Hagard splitting for P, you can see that this thing does have a sort of five handle handle decomposition. Um, can you also get this from the proof of property R? Uh, that's right. Um, yeah, so Ian's question was... Can you get this from the proof of property R? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so you can also get this from the proof of uh, property, property R um, just by the fact that if you do surgery on a knot in S2 times S1, um, you can't get a connected sum of homology spheres. That's right. So this, this is telling you a little bit more information that actually this is sort of, you know, uh, you know interesting from an algebraic topology perspective. Property R is um, yeah, really giving you the handle, handle information, but, that, but that's a great point. Um, and maybe I'll just add some comment here that while this is optimal from the homology ball perspective, if you actually just want to compute min crit of this, um, Gordon and Lukey showed this manifold's not surgery on a knot, so min crit's got to be at least three, and you can just get a very nice surgery description for this manifold and, and compute min crit on the nose. Yes. Oh, you say? What happens if you take more connectors, some of P connectors, some minus P, like n copies of that? Can you give a bound on that? Uh, great. So yeah, if we take more Ps, uh, if you just sort of look at uh, Tobbs' theorem, you're going to get kind of the same information. And basically, the goal of the talk is to say, well, what happens if we take more p's, as you're guessing, and see how much more complicated things get, basically trying to quantify this failure. Um, good. Other questions? Um, OK, so then this is the, the theorem that I want to talk about, which is, yeah, again, just kind of trying to generalize this picture. Um, and I should say everything is joint work with Paolo Echado, Ali Demi, Jen Hom, and Jung Park. Um, and it's, yeah, exactly as Anubhav asked, what happens when we look at a lot of Poincaré spheres connected together? So I'm going to let Yn be just the connect sum of n Poincaré spheres. And then the, the theorem is any definite four manifold with boundary um, 
uh, yn connects a minus yn has at least two n plus one handles. Um, so again, we have some kind of constraint on the kind of four manifold. I'm not telling you that we know that the, com the minimal complexity of this thing is, is large, but if you, for instance, take just a Z homology ball, so take something with very simple homology, that's got to be very complicated. Um, okay. Now, just uh, not for any good reason, but let me just point out that there's nothing so special about the maybe geometry here of having this prime manifold. Um, you, there, there, there's analogously hyperbolic homology spheres uh, with the same property. Okay. Um, so this is the theorem that I want to tell you about, but I also want to advertise for a second um, an even more interesting result. Um, so there's some work in progress of Ali Daimi and also Mike Miller Eismeyer, which says something um, for just this manifold YN. Um, which is that any simply connected uh, four manifold with boundary yn has b2 at least n. So there's some similar kind of complexity constraint. If you have a three manifold whose boundary is yn, it has a lot of uh, b2. And even if you get rid of the pi1 condition, you can still get that min crit of yn is at least n. So they're producing a family of homology spheres that have sort of very, very high complexity in this measure. Um, are these examples spin? Or, or do you think if you add spin condition, you get more? Um, I think kind of, if, if you, yeah, I think it might be true that if you add spin, then maybe you have to have even more B2 or something like this. Um, this first part, it's not clear how spin really helps you, but maybe if you, you kind of spinify it a little bit and you, you use some sort of more spin suitable invariant. Um, that would be better. I mean, I think secretly this is kind of using some spin-like invariant, but I don't, I don't know their stuff well enough, and I shouldn't speak for them. Um, good. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Oh, someone. P is the Poincaré homology sphere. Yeah. So does this answer? There's this question about you know, like the surgery number for a given three manifold. This. If you restrict to integral surgeries, this gives you sort of this gives you examples. But you know, by kind of like taking continu continued fraction expansions, does this, or you know, just like, does this give you, um, you know, examples of irreducible manifolds with arbitrarily large surgery number? Uh, this gives you examples uh, with arbitrarily large integral surgery number. Um, I can't remember. I don't know if Mike is on the call. Um, uh, I can't remember if they have some trick for getting rational surgeries or not. They they might. I mean, but in, until this, I mean, it was wasn't it unknown even whether there's a homology sphere with surgery number greater than. That two. that's right. Yeah. So even the, the these are the first examples with large integer surgery number that is large. Yeah. That's right. Um, OK, so let me kind of try to say something about the strategy of the proof. So I'll sort of set up the framework for the gauge theory, where it's going to come in. And then I'll spend the rest of the time talking about the gauge theory. So let's just suppose we have our uh, definite four manifold 
and it has boundary y n connect sum minus y n, so just a lot of Poincaré spheres. Um, and maybe just for simplicity, I'm going to assume b1 of x is 0. Um, if not, you can kind of surger this away. Um, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the representation variety. Um, and notice that this actually embeds inside of SU2 a bunch of products of SU2 where that product is basically coming from the number of generators of pi 1. So if, SU2, if pi 1 of x has very few generators, then the representation variety embeds inside of a very small number of products of SU2. Um, and so if we look at the dimension of this object, say as a, some kind of algebraic variety, real algebraic variety, then we get that the dimension is at most three times the number of the generators by this embedding here. Um, and of course, how do we build pi 1? We use handles. Right? We use one handles. So, So if we can show that this representation variety is very big, then we know our any, um, you know, that any handle decomposition has lots of one handles. So now that's maybe kind of the first place where we can see, well, OK, maybe some gauge theory is going to help us understand the handle decompositions of four manifolds. Um, OK, so the next thing is kind of silly, but we're just going to change our perspective a tiny bit. So I have x. Its boundary is yn connect sum minus yn. I want to turn it into sort of more TQFT land. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach a three handle and just view this as a cobordism now, w. And that cobordism is going to go from uh, yn to yn. And after flipping things upside down and reversing orientation, I can assume that w is a negative definite four manifold. Um, and this is going to be good because this is going to tell me my cobordism maps and instance on floor homology are degree preserving. I'm going to be counting some index zero moduli. Um, OK, great. Um, OK, so then what we can do is we can look at the inclusion from pi 1 of yn to pi 1 of w, which is really the same as pi 1 of x. Right? We attach a three handle. It doesn't change pi 1 at all. We're interested in x, but we're going to study w. Um, and representation varieties are contravariant, so we get a map from r of x to r of yn. And this object is nicely 3n dimensional. Right? Pi 1 of a connected sum is a free product. And so that means the representation variety is just going to be a product of representation varieties of the Poincare sphere. And so one can easily check that this is 3n dimensional. Um, that's great. And so then what we're going to do, so OK, we haven't really done anything yet. And so then the key thing is we're going to use our churn simons um, and our instanton floor homology to, sh to understand this image. So we'll show that the, dim the dimension of the image of iota star uh, is at least 3n, or I guess is equal to 3n. So we're going to show that the image of iota star hits some maximal dimensional component of the representation variety. And so if this thing has large dimension, so does this. Um, so therefore, this has at least n. Uh, th this dimension is at least, oops, sorry, 3n. 
And so we can put that together. So here we have a bunch of one handles. There's also a zero handle sitting around. I told you we had b1 equals zero. So that means there better be a bunch of two handles to kill all this b1 we've created from all our one handles. And so basically, this implies that um, any handle decomposition is actually at least 2n plus 1 many handles. Explain how you go from 3n to 2n. I don't see it. Oh, so 3n gives us, OK, so yeah, um, good question. So 3n gives us n1 handles by this here. And then now it's just, OK, there's also a 0 handle. And also if b1 equals 0, you need to attach a bunch of 2 handles to kill the h1 you've created. You need at least n of those. So then that gives you the 2n plus 1. Good. OK, um, any other questions? OK, so now we've got to do some gauge theory. OK, so um, what's our setup? So y is an integer homology sphere. Um, we have the churn simons functional, which usually I think of as I have my uh, space of uh, connections on a trivial SU2 bundle. I mod out by the gauge group. And that gives me some map to R mod z. Um, and in this case, so if, if you don't know what this is, it doesn't matter, but it's some function from some weird object to R mod z. And the critical points of this functional are precisely the representation variety for y uh, mod conjugation. So it's the character, the SU2 character variety for y. Um, this is wrong. This is not what we want to do. Um, we want to do something slightly different. Um, and what we want to do is actually we're going to Instead, mod out by degree 0 gauge transformations. Which allows us to think of the churn simons functional as just being some real valued function. OK, so this is good. This is what we want to do. And so in this setup, the critical points are what we'd call maybe like lifted characters. But you can think of this as sort of a z's worth of the character variety. OK. Um, if, you don't, if, if you don't like uh, churn simons gauge theory, then um, I'm going to kind of give you a different perspective in a second. Um, but what we want to do is we're going to turn this into some kind of instanton Fleur type theory. And the way I'm going to set this up is my generators for this theory, I'm going to generate by these lifted flat connections over Q. Um, or equivalently, 
Um, I could think of it as chi of y. So for each representation mod, or each conjugacy class of representation, I'm going to produce a whole Laurent polynomial rings worth, where x is kind of act, is acting as the deck transformation on this um, sort of covering space of my configuration space. But if, yeah, so basically just think of every representation I have of pi 1 into SU2, I have like an infinite tower's worth of generators. Um, OK, and of course, you don't really do this, right? We need perturbations. So I'm really looking at perturbed, lifted, flat connections. Um, but I, I'm kind of just going to ignore perturbations for a little bit. Um, but the, the thing that's nice about lifting to this r-valued function is now we can really think of two gratings. Where gratings is a little bit in quotes, but um, the, f the first grating is sort of your usual FLIR or homological grating. And rather than being z mod 8 grating, this you can just think of as being a nice z grating now. And the second uh, piece of information is we just look at the value of churn simons value. And that's no longer, that's not z valued, uh, that's r valued. But so associated to our generators, to our critical points, um, we have kind of this uh, pair of numbers that will give us some interesting information. Um, And I'll also say we have some operators. I'll say d, d1, d2, and u. And where do these operators come from? So they come from uh, counting, well, we can think of it as, say, counting ASD uh, connections. on y times r, or alternatively, you can just think of gradient flows of this churn simons functional. So you can just think of it, basically, we're doing some abstract, more somology picture here. And maybe rather than saying too much, let me draw a picture of an example that you can keep in mind. Um, and then maybe I can say a little bit more about these operators, if that's helpful. Um, I do want to keep the strategy on the board. So as you might expect, the example we're interested in is the Poincaré sphere. And to get my orientations right, let me orient it as the boundary of a negative definite uh, E8 plumbing. OK. And the character variety is not too complicated. There's one representation which is just the trivial representation. There is another representation, we'll call it alpha. Uh, this has grading 1 and churn simons value 1 over 120. And then there's another beta, another irreducible representation beta, whose grading is 5, and the churn simons value is 49 over 120. So what am I supposed to do if I want to build this instance on theory? I need a z's worth of each of these three flat connections. Um, 
I should tell you a little bit about how the gratings work um, with regards to this x. So maybe let me come over here and just emphasize uh, grading of x. Um, how does that work? It raises uh, the Fleur grading, the homological grading, by 8. Um, and it raises the Chern-Simons value by 1. So now I can draw this entire complex for you, or this entire picture. So maybe uh, down here I'm going to have the trivial by degree 0, 0, alpha up higher is beta, then up higher than that is x alpha, oh, sorry, x theta, x alpha, and it kind of goes off in all directions. I'll just remind you, I'll kind of put them in here. Alpha is 1, 1 over 120. Beta was 5, 49 over 120. Now x theta, we just raise uh, the first grading by 8, the second grading by 1. Um, x alpha, same thing, 9 up by 1. And you can now just extend all these gradings all the way up and down this chain. Okay. Now, I'm supposed to tell you some operators here. Um, the only one that we're really going to care, only two we'll care about today are D1 and, and U. The other ones don't show up for this Poincaré sphere. So D1 is supposed to count uh, flows to the trivial connection. And so indeed, in the Poincaré sphere, there is some index 1 flow from here down to here. Uh, so D, this is D1. And this drops grading by minus 1. So it can only uh, kind of go from things congruent to 1 mod 8. And then the other thing we care about is U. And I'll just say this has grading minus 4. And it goes between irreducible things. And there's a U here. Oh, up to Q, it's, it, this is multiplication by some non-zero element. Um, and then also, there could be something from X alpha to beta. And in fact, there is. And you have this sort of infinite U tower going up and down as well. And then the other, the other uh, operator is D. That's just the usual differential in the instanton Fleur complex. So D happens to be 0, and D2 equals 0 in this example. So we kind of only care about this data here. And I know I'm black boxing it a little bit, but the important thing is this is counting flows to the trivial connection. Mm -hmm. I want to keep that too, keep our strategy. Um, so this, something that's nice is uh, this behaves well under cobordisms, as you might expect. So behaves well under cobordisms. And the best way to understand a structure is to use that structure to prove a theorem. So let's actually prove Taubes' theorem from the beginning of the talk. Um, which is that there doesn't exist a simply connected definite uh, four manifold from the Poincaré sphere to itself. Um, and again, after some orientation reversal, we can assume that it's a negative definite. Uh, it's a negative definite cobordism. So again, we're going to transport that picture of, of our, comp, of our uh, picture for P. So we had, remember, we had trivial alpha 
beta. And there's a bunch of other stuff that we, we're not going to draw. This is for p. We have another copy of p over here. Theta, uh-oh. Uh, we also have alpha and beta. And as you might expect, uh, the cobordism map is going to send some elements over here to some elements over here. And the useful thing here is that we can understand what's going on between the trivial connection. So the cobordism map for W uh, this is actually just going to count reducible flat connections. Um, and so they're, they're sort of, I'll just say counts the reducible flat connection here. So pi 1 of this thing, you know, supposing that pi 1 of this thing was trivial, then we just have one, we just have an isomorphism from the Q generated by theta to the Q generated by theta. And then on this side, we know we have d1. On that side, we know we have d1. And if w has any, you know, the cobordism map induced by w has any structure, then we would expect that alpha should go to alpha, or some multiple of alpha, um, under this cobordism map. So this is, I'll just say this is the, what the cobordism map on, on W is doing. And so what it gives us is some connection on W. So there exists some ASD um, connection. I'll call it A in the index 0 moduli space from alpha to alpha. OK, that doesn't sound very nice or helpful. But the key thing is that, well, how much energy does an ASD connection have? That energy is telling, is kind of governed by how much the Chern-Simons values drop from here to here. And how much does it drop if it's going from something to itself? It can't drop at all. So it has no energy. So uh, the key thing is with the energy, of A has to be 0. And therefore, A is flat. And so you have this flat connection, inter like sort of interpolating between these irreducible connections on the end. And so that means that, um, well, there exists some pi 1 of W into SU2, which is not 0, right? We've built, built this non trivial flat connection. <clears throat> How do you know that that ASD connection doesn't go from X to one of the other lifts of A? Uh, because, so this is like the, kind of the magic of working in all this mod degree zero gauge transformations, is now when I say I'm counting index zero, like that, that's got to, like really index zero here has actually got to preserve this grading and not just preserve the grading mod eight. But then how do you know that ASD connection exists? Oh, because this, because this square has to commute. Like, because the cobordism map is like a chain map in some sense. So if I have something that goes here to here, then I have to have something going here to cancel, to, to make it a chain map. So that's what tells me there's some index zero thing. And then because the chern simons values here are the same, that tells me it's energy zero. Um, OK, so this is kind of not actually that special to the Poincare sphere. You can kind of now imagine if you have things in your instance on complex that go to the trivial connection, then you would expect that maybe by some kind of chain map argument, you have to see some interesting uh, connection going this way. And if you get lucky, it might be flat. 
Um, and so let me just say some, some kind of general nonsense. So in general, um, I'll just say if we use the alpha with the lowest possible churn Simons, uh, such that d1 of alpha is not 0, um, OK, if, if, if such a thing exists, maybe d1 is always 0. But if you have some alpha which d1 is to be non-zero, um, and I guess maybe you want alpha to be a cycle, um, then sort of the w chain map produces actually, again, a, an interesting flat connection on your cobordism w. So you could, in principle, say, well, what if I got some cobordism? It sends alpha to some other alpha prime with lower churn simons functional. Then you might have some positive energy. And you might not get something flat. But if you go to the lowest energy one, or the lowest churn simons functional one, then that one's going to extend over your cobordism. OK, again, and I'm being a little bit sloppy here. There should be perturbations. And well, one has to be a little more careful. But this is sort of the rough, the rough idea. Um, and so that brings me to some kind of basically a moral definition of uh, the kind of uh, key invariant here. So we have um, the gamma invariant of, of uh, Ali Daimi, which says that if we look at um, some, let's say, positive integer, just to make things simple, I want to define some numerical invariant. I just look at this minimal churn Simons uh, value. So this is defined, I'm, I minimize over alpha, churn Simons of alpha. And I want to make sure that, OK, I look at the degree. I make sure it's 4i minus 3. And I want alpha to be a cycle. And I'm going to have some weird condition, which I'll write down. And then I'll try to explain it a little more in a second. OK. So here's the first, first picture is take i equals 1. So we want something in degree 1 uh, for which d1 is non-zero. Is that d1 of u oh. I, I applied to alpha? Oh, applied to alpha, yes. Thank you. I need to apply this to alpha. Thanks. And so that's really just capturing exactly this picture here. That, OK, d1 is non-zero, and I look at the minimal churn Simons, and that's what we wanted to capture, because that gave us a flat connection here. But now we could use the fact that we have this interesting u operation from x alpha or sorry, u operation from beta to alpha. So let me draw that in. u, u. And now I have this, you know, remember now I, this map is supposed to be non-zero to commute with this. And so then actually I even get something higher up here that has to exist. And again, by the same argument, this thing will also give me a flat connection. So I have now beta goes down to alpha goes down to theta, and this is non-trivial. So I have to have something non-trivial here, then u, then down to trivial. And so that's where these higher i's are showing up here. It's kind of like when, so, so the picture, in the picture i equals 2, or i equals 1, alpha from the example. And then i equals 2 is talking about beta from the example. And you can imagine sort of longer and longer u towers giving you some interesting, uh, lots of different interesting flat connections. And so that's the theorem. Basically, the theorem is that if your gamma value is interesting, then you have these flat connections. You have these SU2 representations that extend over the four manifold.
And so again, to, I should say, you know, to define gamma, you really need to use some perturbations. But this is basically the definition uh, when your eyes are, are positive. Um, so the first theorem is really what we just proved, actually, which is that so if this gamma is interesting, so if, uh, let's say, 0 is less than gamma y of i is less than infinity, and you say you have w from y to y, uh, which is a, a definite uh, cobordism, uh, then there exists some element in the representation variety uh, whose churn simons actually agrees with this gamma value. And this representation extends over the cobordism w. So if this gamma invariant, however you compute it, happens to be interesting, then interesting things extend over your cobordism. And then sort of the key kind of technical extension of this uh, for, for our theorem, um, and, and there's some very similar version of this technical uh, theorem due to Masaki Taniguchi, says that uh, if also, so we have gamma y of i is less than infinity, and our churn simons functional is more spot, you can actually extend a whole component of the representation variety over your four manifold. Um, so if this happens, then there exists a component, I'll call it R0 of R of y, uh, which extends over uh, your w. And again, the sort of values of churn simons for anything in this uh, component are exactly your gamma invariant. So that's kind of the key thing is that if your if your sort of if your churn simons functional looks nice, you can actually get lots and lots of representations extending over your cobordism. Okay, so maybe in the last minute, I'll just tell you what happens. Um, so. Um, so then the key thing is you just want to compute, maybe using a Kunis formula, so you want to compute this gamma function for a connected sum of Poincaré spheres. And you get some very nice feature, for instance, that the evaluated at 2n, some very kind of big index, you get that this is exactly 49n over 120 where n is how many Poincaré spheres you've connected with itself. So you, you can kind of compute this. So there's some component which extends over w, but you want to figure out which component that is. And so where would this 49n over 120 come from? It might come from taking n copies of something with churn simons 49 over 120. And that was this beta, right? This had 49 over 120. And so I'll just say that this, um, you can check. So can check that the component of the representation variety of these, this connected sum of Poincaré spheres, which is actually just a n-fold Cartesian product of the uh, one for the Poincaré sphere by itself. Um, the component that's going to extend coming from this theorem um, is the one containing just beta in each component, or in, in each factor. So on each connect sum and, I do beta. And I look at that component of the representation variety. And since it's irreducible on each sum, this is 3n dimensional.
So we have a 3n dimensional component which extends. And that's what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to find a 3n dimensional component which extended. Right? That's basically asking to be in the image. Extending is asking to be in the image of, of this iota star. And so then we've shown that this thing is 3n dimensional. We did it. And so now using um, whatever, oh, where did it go before? You know, now using our observation up here, our dimension is big, so our handle, our handle decomposition has to be big as well. Um, so I think I'm out of time, so I, I won't get to say anything more about how the, the proof of this goes or, or um, you know, how, you, how you, in fact, check this. But maybe, hopefully, this kind of sketches the idea that goes into the proof. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. <laughs>